So a moment ago, what we did was we added one um, attribute to our CSS selector right here that says anything that is marked as class equals wide image, notice the way that I spelled it, will then have a width that we define right here. So if we set other <coughs> images to be class equals wide image, then all of those will obey this selector. Um, we are going to add a little bit more customization to this, to that particular picture. And I'm going to show you this trick with Notepad. I've got at the top tabs, just like a web browser. I can switch to the index tab and the CSS tab, but I'd like to actually see them both at once. I'd like to see the CSS rules and then the HTML code. So here's the trick. Uh, if you right-click the tab of Codica CSS, right-click it, you get some options. The one you want to select is Move to Other View at the bottom. That's the fancy way of it saying, put them in multiple windows, multiple yes. columns. Yeah. To put it back, you right-click it again and select Move to Other View. So there's basically two views. I don't think you can make like three columns unless you've got like a big monitor to work with. I think it's only those two views, left and right. Um, but anyway, move to other view, and then now you can look at your HTML on one side and your CSS on the other. I want to go back to my CSS rule here, wide image. Um, it's got a width. Let's also do this. Does anyone remember how to add rounded corners to an element. Radius. Close. Does anyone remember what the full code is? Border dash radius. Colon. And then if we have one value, let's say 5px, semicolon, that will apply that to the four corners of my image. My image has four corners. So with it, with adding one value there, it applies to the four. So now if I run it, I have right here a five pixel board, a five pixel radius, a five pixel rounding along the corners, all four corners. If I'm emphasizing all four corners, that must mean that actually I can apply this to each corner in a different way. So, notice how the top left corner and the bottom right corner still have five pixels. But then the top right corner and the bottom left corner have more roundness. The way I did that was, look what I did here, 5px space 25px. So I'm applying 5 pixels to the top left and right, uh, the top left and bottom right, and then 25 pixel roundness to the top right and bottom left. You didn't have to go back and see the class first. We don't have to edit. We don't have to edit the class on the HTML, but what we're editing is the class in the CSS file. Yes. We can apply percentages here also, although they kind of behave a bit weird. Um, let me let me do this. Fifty-five percent, and then twenty-five pixels. Let's see what that looks like. <laughs> so that would have been something in the old days that I would design in Photoshop. And here with a simple line of code, CSS3, border dash radius, and then I can control the different corners. Well, what if I say all four corners, 55%? Well, let's do 25%. So let's see, 
It's a different kind of roundedness. I can put a hundred percent roundness, and now that cir that square picture is totally round. So you can put whatever you want here. I'm going to put it a little bit more subtle. I'll just put 25 pixels. I'm also going to add a... Um, a, uh, a drop shadow. Well, drop shadow might be played out, so let me do instead. Let's do um, let's do border. Border will allow us to put a, a border around the the picture. I'll explain how in just a moment because it's got a few it's got a few extra items to apply here. I have to apply the the size and then the style and then the color. So I have three values that I have to say. Well, how do I define this border? So let's say first of all, just to make it obvious, we'll say five pixels. This will be a five pixel thick border. I have a, a few different styles of borders, but I'll start off with solid. So five pixels, space, solid, space. What color? Just for the moment to be obvious, I'll write pink. And now if you check the results, look at that, a little border, five pixels, solid, pink. We have solid, we have dashed, we can do a dashed style. That dashed lines around it, kind of like maybe a coupon. Twenty five pixels. I put twenty five pixels and notice how big and interesting now that looks. So we have solid, we have dashed, we have one called double, I believe. We can look these up, but let's see, double looks like a little double edge. So um, I'm adding here a border to that element via CSS. Uh, border is, uh, is, is older CSS1 standard. Uh, border radius is CSS3. So that might not work on older browsers. So actually, you can make yourself a note here. Remember comments. I'm going to add a comment at the <coughs> end of that line of border radius just to say CSS3 only. So you can add comments like that also at the end of a line. That's a comment for me that this only the CSS3 only, therefore it doesn't work on older browsers. I'm adding this border, and it's got these three parameters: a size, a style of the border, and then a color. Oftentimes when I've been talking about color, I've been dealing with uh, a named value. I've been typing yellow or blue or azure, etc. We can also define colors in different ways. Uh, let's do it this way. Instead of gray, let's write RGB with open and close parentheses. Now what we can do here is mix colors. We can mix shades of red, green, and blue. 
If you took any art classes, graphic design classes, we talk about color theory in there, that if you mix like a red and a green, you get another color. If you mix the green and the blue, you get another color. You mix a lot of red with a lot of blue, you get this other color. So we can mix colors together. Red, green, blue. So the way this works is between 0 and 255. 0 means none of this color. 255 means all of this color. So if we write 255 comma 0 comma 0, that means this color is completely red. There's no green, there's no blue. Just red, yes. So if we check it, there it is, bright red. Okay, less bright red between 0 and 255. Halfway between there is 128. Or 127, I guess. And then that, not as strong of a red. Half of that, 64. An even darker version of red. It's almost black. It looks black on the projector, but on my screen I see, I see it's still reddish. So basically, the closer you get to zero, the darker the color is. So that when the color is zero, 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 completely black. That's another way to write black. <coughs> Let's say I have full red, 255, and I'll add half of green, which is 120. Seven, one twenty-five, one twenty-eight, one twenty-eight. So half of red, uh, full red, half green, no blue. Orange, a shade of orange. I add more green, two hundred green, more toward yellowish now. Full green, two fifty-five pure yellow, bright yellow. And then playing with, okay, let's add a smidgen of blue, 64. Not very noticeable change. Actually, I'm, it's making it lighter because now as you start to increase, just like we decreased all the values down to zero, and we got black. Now if we increase all the values to the maximum, what's the opposite of black? White. Notice that's getting brighter and brighter and brightest, 255, 255, 255, pure white. So all of them down to zero, pure black. All of them up to 255, pure white. So I found pink here, full red, full blue, 200 green. Now this might uh, not be very efficient because then you're trying to mix the right color and you're going to spend time mixing a color where you can just type orange. But what's useful, what's useful about doing it this way is we can add one more element here. We can add transparency. Maybe I want orange, but a little bit transparent. We cannot do that by simply typing orange. We have to do it this way. Right now we're dealing with red, green, blue. Right now we're going to deal with red, green, blue, alpha. If you change it to RGBA, you've got now a fourth property, which is alpha, which means transparency. So the fourth value over here, 1, means 100% visible, so that should look the same. If we put 0.5, 50% visible, look at that, I can see through it to the color behind it, which is a gray. 0.25, now it's 25% um, visible. So I'm seeing through it even more, and then all the way down to 
zero invisible. There is still a border there, it's just that I can't see it. And this will look more impressive if we had multiple elements on top of each other that really were meaningful right here. It almost looks like we're just brightening up the color, but we are seeing through it. If we had instead a background picture, like let's say stars, we would be able to see through this color and see those stars. It's just that because we've got a gray background and we're seeing through it, it sort of looks like we're just brightening the picture. We are seeing through it. The color, that is. And that's working because we've got RGBA, A for alpha, and it goes between 0 and 1. 0 to 100. 0 and 1. And what that RGBA is, actually, that's CSS3. That doesn't work with older browsers. RGB works with older browsers, but not RGBA. So I'll make a note. <coughs> RGBA only works with modern browsers. Now at the moment, our picture is set to a width of 100% and some other little uh, embellishments. And so the picture grows and shrinks to the size of the monitor or the, or the mobile device. And that might be an effect that, that I like. See how it grows and shrinks. So it's always going to show the picture completely, just different sizes. So if a person has a small type of device like that, they'll, they'll see the picture in total, but then maybe not really the details. We're going to do a different, we're going to take a slightly different approach, which you may or may not want to do ultimately, but I'll show you both ways. What I'm going to do is, instead of it showing the picture completely, growing and shrinking, what I want it to do is, it's going to show more or less of the picture as the size of the screen increases. So if someone's got a large device, it'll show more of the picture. If someone's got a smaller device, imagine only it shows this much of the picture. So as it grows and shrinks, it shows more of the picture. We can see that evident in the example. If a person has a size that monitor that or device that big, notice how much you see. You see the girl here and then the back of, of this girl's head. If they've got a larger device or in landscape mode, it's going to grow to show more of the picture. See, we see that girl looking at us. And then if they've got an even larger device, you know, they'll see the guy right there. All the way to a certain point where eventually the picture runs out. But you can see all of that. That's a different kind of effect. We'll do that now. So do you see the difference? One is that the picture is shown completely at all times. It's growing and shrinking. At some point, I think, then it's going to be too small to see details. Another way to do it is to hide the overflow. So there's parts of the picture that overflow, that flow outside of the viewport, so hide it. That's what we'll do right now. Go back to our code, our CSS code. The next line after border. There is a there is an attribute that is called literally overflow. 
and it has different values. The value that we want is hidden. So notice CSS can define widths and sizes. It can define radii. It can define borders and colors and other kinds of concepts. We can look all of the rules up, of course, and all of the uh, attributes over at W3Schools, for example. But overflow, colon, hidden, what this would do is anything that goes outside of the boundaries will be hidden. However, if you save it and run it, it doesn't seem to be paying attention. It's the whole thing. So actually, we're not quite there yet. Overflow hidden works best when there is a container to then be the arbiter of what is hidden. So let's say I've got this shape right here. And if I've got this pencil inside of it, stuff of, part of it is overflowing, isn't it? So we're going to apply overall hidden to this container out here, not to the image itself. Right now we've attached white image to the image, <coughs> and, it, and we're not really telling it exactly how do we deal with that overflow doesn't quite make sense. We're going to attach overflow hidden to a container and then so that when that goes outside of the container that will be hidden. So we need to change this a little bit. Not the actual rule. We need to change how it's applied to the document. So just to confirm, everyone has this code at this point. Overflow colon hidden. No space on overflow. It's one word. We need to apply wide image class to a container that contains the image. So we'll switch over to the index HTML file. Here's our image. We need to apply this to a container. We will use the div tag. The div tag is a generic container that has no, not much inherent meaning, and via CSS people then make it do cool things. So let's add div tag slash div tag so that it wraps around the image tag. Div slash div. Line 57 and 59 or so. Wrap a div tag around the image. This is a generic div, and therefore if we save and run it, nothing happens yet, because it doesn't know to use that rule. So actually, we're going to remove the class from the image because we're not quite using it the right way. We're going to remove it and actually add it to the div container. So what you can do is drag and drop, select class, and drag it to the div there, with, with a space, of course. <coughs> Let me add a space right there add a space in the div, and then cut and paste or drag and drop class equals white image, the whole thing, drag it to the div. So now I'm attaching all of the properties that I defined earlier to a container instead of the image. It was doing everything we wanted when it was attached to the image except this one trick of overflow because then there was no container to bound it to overflow. So I've created the container, attached the class, and now what's inside of the container will be bound by those rules or should be bound. Let's see if that worked. Save both files. Look at that. There's the full-sized image and as I increase the size, it's showing more of the image. It still has the roundness and the border and all of those cool effects, but now it's showing more of the image, depending on the person's monitor. Yes? I have Me too. Look at that. I've got some weird, some weird edge. I'll deal, we'll deal with that in just a moment. But good eye there. 
do you guys see that too? There's an there's a weird empty space there somewhere. Um, this is what I'm saying about CSS is hard. Now this is not obviously tragic, but it is if you're a perfectionist, you know, web designer, which a lot of us are. And so um, I want to fix that. And the thing is that sometimes a CSS rule might conflict with another one, or perhaps there's a property that is built in that is affecting our concept. And so this one was one that um, you wouldn't think would be affecting, but it does. And I had to do some research, and I had to figure this out. Um, how do you get rid of that little space? Well, what's happening is, uh, technically, uh, the div has a few built-in properties. And one of the properties is causing this little thing. So the property is that if we've got some text, um, like on this here, we've got text, we've got a line, and then a line below it. We've got some space between the lines, or the amount of space allocated for each line. This is known as the line height. There's a built-in amount of line height between each one, so that the text is not crunched up against each other. There's a built-in amount, and that's what's causing that. It's assuming you're going to have text there. It gives us a little bit of line height, so that the next line below it doesn't conflict with the one above it. But there's no text here, so in our case, it looks like an empty space. <coughs> an empty space. So we're going to nullify that. We're going to say remove that line height. It's not doing what we want. So we're going to go back to our CSS rule and we're going to add one more little bit back to the CSS file after overflow hidden. Now we will add line height. Notice whenever there's a two-word property there's a dash. Line dash height colon, and the value is zero. Don't put any line height here. There is some default, maybe it was 5 or 10 or something, because many times you might have text and a little bit of line height between the text is nice and readable. But in our case, it doesn't look good, so we'll nullify it. We'll say zero it out. And notice we don't put a value because zero is zero. Zero percent, zero pixel, zero whatever. It's just, it's just the number zero. Did that fix it? Yes. So there we go. Now it's a nice snug border around the picture. Yes? Are you also seeing an edge on the right side? Yeah. That might be something else. It shouldn't be related to that. Check your check here your, your HTML that you don't have some, um, you know, if you have a space, it technically is something in the div, so that might be causing that weird space. I might have to check yours, because it should not be extra space just at the bottom. Now, do you mean? Do you mean if you're maximized like this, and then at the end you see a space? Okay, let me show you. Let me show you this. You mean like that? The picture ran out. The picture ran out. So if my screen is that big, I have no more picture to show. So there's a big empty gap. And notice if I if I am within the size of the picture, like I said, you, you, it's larger, larger, larger. At a certain point, the picture runs out, and I stop. But if I keep going, well, there's no more picture, so there's a gap. So the answer to that is get a bigger picture. Actually, I have a question. Yes. Is there a way for you to position the picture in such a way where you get it to where you want to be, and you feel like really anal about where you want the picture to be? There is because maybe you want the maybe you want that part of the picture to be the most prominent instead of center. I have to look it up off the top of my head. I'm forgetting what it is, but there is a way to align it top, bottom, left, right, wherever we want. I have to look it up. Or does anyone know it off the top of your heads? Align a picture. Yeah, we have to look it up. So maybe we'll do align a picture. Uh, to the left in a div. I think 
it's called position. Align and float. Horizontal align. So there'll be an answer somewhere. Left align, <coughs> center align, floating. Margin? No. So we'd have to look it up, but th there'll be an answer somewhere so that we can position it. Maybe not align, position. Position a picture. Float left will will always make it to the left, but what if I want... Um, if I float it left, it'll be left, but perhaps the first thing <coughs> I want to see here is that person. So float left won't make it all the way to the left. Float left, what I want to do is force the picture so that the first thing that I see is, is that dad right there. That's going to be that I'm going to move the picture to the left, not just float it. Position, I think it's going to be about position. Align and flow, CSS position. Like that, maybe. Fixed position, position fixed, top right. Position left, negative 20. Uh, let's see that. Position relative and then left negative 20. <clears throat> Probably actually we'd have to apply it to the image itself, not to the container. Let's see what happens. Okay, this aligned the whole container. Now notice my container is 20 pixels to the left. And there's a gap here. So, we would apply this to another rule, getting advanced here, wide image, image. So here what I'm saying is, an image inside of the wide image div, there is a space there, an image inside of the wide image div, move it to the left, 20 be obvious, 200 pixels. You see, it's more advanced. Now I'm saying an element inside of an element. I've got an image inside of a div called wide image. So now we're saying that image's position is relative to the other elements, and specifically its left edge will be moved 200 pixels to the left. that the dad seems to be moving more to the left. Yeah, look at that. The dad is to the left. But then now I have more empty space on the right. So if I've got it like this, there we go. So the first thing I see now is more about the dad, whereas that empty space that was with for the whole panorama. So there's there's the trick there. I've targeted an image inside of that named div position relative move it to the move its left edge negative 500 pixels off the edge of the screen maybe we should write a comment here that would be useful so this is basically uh, select or target an image inside of the div with class equals wide image. So CSS is very powerful, very cool, and it could be very difficult to work with. So in my company we work with a lot of people's websites, oftentimes WordPress, uh, and oftentimes we have to go in and write custom code. So there's so many times where I've had to reverse engineer a theme and figure out, okay, this particular element needs to be edited like this, and then we need to write some code for it. We'll do some of that a little bit later because we will want to customize our project even more, and so we'll often have to do something like this. How did I know to do, to do, to do this? Experience. And I'll give you that experience as we proceed in the class.
So if you're not seeing it, here's the big difference. With, without editing that relative position, the first thing we see is this lady right here. And with adding the negative 200, well now I see this as the first thing. We created this class here so that we may reuse it. So what we'll do is, I asked you to download five pictures. Let's add another one of those pictures to a different screen and then apply this rule so that it also looks consistent like the first screen. So in my folder, I have a couple of images. I have the library image and one of students. I also now want to show those students on another screen. And I want it to behave like my home screen's style. So I'm going to find, before you go further, I want to find where in my computer's screen I want to add one picture. So again, I could search, I, I could browse and find it like this and get lost because there's a lot of code to look at, or let's get used to control F. What are we going to look for here to quickly jump us to the computer's screen? What could we search for? PC. I might have used the word PC in other parts. I might have said on the home page, take our classes and learn how to use your PC. Okay, that's not perhaps specific enough. What's very specific is I know we wrote ID equals PC. And that only exists in one place throughout the code. So find that. There we go. Line 149. So this just takes a little getting used to. Okay, we're going to search. Maybe we search too generically. We want to search specifically. So I have to think back. What did I write in my document that is specific to the place I'm trying to find? And I know only one place in my project does that. Do I have ID equals PC? So I've got uh, H1, I've got the nav. That at least took me in the, in the general area. I actually have to be inside of the article right here, 177. I've got the heading, computer classes, and then I've got my list view. I want to add a picture um, right there, just like I did before. And now that I know what I'm, what I'm kind of going for, I'm going to write it more completely at this point. So after the heading 2, in the computer classes screen, line 180 or so, I'm going to write the div, close the div. Again, I write the opening and closing so that I don't forget to close it because I can easily forget to close that div and write all of this stuff and then the thing is broken. Open and close the divs. Div needs a class, wide image. It's a class so I can reuse it. Inside of the div, I need an image. Image has is a single self-closing tag. It has properties, source. I'll fill that in in a moment because I need to look up its file name. And also, I recommend alt, that one sentence description about what the picture is, so you can be accessibility compliant. In my case, my picture is a classroom of students. Whatever yours is, write that. And it, is, and it should be written like a normal sentence, capital letters, proper grammar, punctuation if you want it. And now on my source, you need to get your file name. And of course, if your file name has capital letters and so forth, make sure it's exactly the same case sensitivity, or the picture may not load. So 
So I've got the class that defines how the picture behaves, and then the actual picture, and the alt attribute. So now I'll save that. I'll go to my computer classes screen, and now I should see that picture with all of the properties, all of the values of the wide image class. This is the point of using a CSS file. It applies then automatically to all my, all my pictures. What's that? The name of the folder, good point, yes. It's in a folder called images. Easy to forget. So in the folder of images is your image. So don't forget that. All right, so my home screen, my computer screen, there it is. It shows that much of the picture, 200 pixels moved over, and then more of it. Because it's a class and because it's applied to, um, well, not because it's a class, because in this case I made another rule here that applies to any image inside of that div. Now it applied to both, and now it's not quite looking good for both images. So I just deactivated that CSS. This one that moved it over. So we spent most of the day talking about CSS. That's still just the tip of the iceberg. We've seen the importance of uh, adding our CSS rules inside of a CSS file so that then it's more global. Maybe we had other, uh, other files. We will have another file later. We've got right now index.html, and later on when we add the map, we will have map.html. And so if we had made these rules inline, they would only apply to the index file. And we'd have to copy and paste them to the map file. Putting them in a CSS file, and then simply having a line at the top of both documents that say link, style sheet, that Codica file, then both of those files, index and map, will inherit every one of these rules and apply to both files, be consistent. And we've seen we can control elements in a variety of ways. There's still, of course, many properties and values, but uh, we can look those up as necessary throughout the course. You can always take a, a preview and look, at, look, the, look them up over at w3schools.com. You'll find a variety of websites that have a list of all possible CSS rules, but as I said, I recommend w3schools.com. And you've got Learn CSS, and then also somewhere, where did I see it? References. At the top right, References. Um, CSS 1, 2, and 3 references. It'll just list every possible CSS um, rule. So we've looked at background color, but we've also got background position, background image. All of that is in the reference, 
screen at w3schools.com. It's a great site that I recommend that you visit because it's got a lot of great information <coughs> on all of these topics. And as you go through the lessons, then you get a, a certificate of completion at the end. Uh, I believe you have to take a, a, a test, and then you get a certificate. So we're going to main the, end the main lecture in just a moment, but do we have any general questions? Yes? Uh, could you have centered, or uh, could you have, um, yeah, uh, centered the image within the new div tag so the border would have corresponded to it no matter how it was sized or what the size of the image was to at least uh, center that uh, dead white space all around the image? Work? Yes, um, we probably have to do it in a different way in that right now the image again is behaving as it wants, it's just taking as much space as it wants. We could also add another rule and say let that image stretch out to fill this div and then that way you won't have that gap. So I'd have to look up exactly how to do that but based on the references here we could, we could figure that out. So yeah, we but would we be. We want to distort the image by stretching it. This event on some devices is more, yeah. Yes, that is so true. My question was more like um, take the white space that's happening on the side and disperse it evenly around the image. Is there a way to do that with CSS? Yeah, probably we'd have, we'd have to take a two-pronged approach because we would add the, we would probably add the border. <coughs> We would probably add the border to the image itself so that the image always has the, the correct size border, there's no gap. And then deal with the overflow in the other rule. So one rule is dealing with it overflowing and another is dealing with the border, perhaps. Do you ever use a horizontal and a vertical centering mechanism within the tip? There is, yeah, there is a way to do that. Again, I'd have to look it up, but we definitely can center things within an element. I think it's simply um, a matter of saying, um, you know, vertical dash alignment equals center and horizontal dash alignment equals center. That might not be the whole answer because, again, other pieces of the CSS puzzle might be deterring us. So sometimes it's not as easy as just writing one line of code. Sometimes it interlocks with something else. Like line height. I would never have thought really to use line height to get rid of that little gap at the bottom. But through the research, uh, troubleshooting figured out that that was what the problem was. Any other general questions? All right, I'm going to put my version of the code at this point in the, in the folder. We're going to wrap up and have some lab time to 9.30. So thanks for coming. We'll do it again next time.